Hi guys, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about asthma. So um, let's quickly define what asthma is. So asthma is a chronic um, inflammatory condition whereby we get the narrowing of our airways, making it difficult to breathe. And this can be really fatal sometimes if they get like acute exacerbation of their asthma. So um, it's a very, very common problem as well. So it's really important for us to understand the pathophysiology, how we diagnose this and the treatments for asthma. So first, let's talk about the causes or the risk factors for asthma. So there are a lot of things that can lead to the development of asthma. So it can be like a genetic predisposition to asthma. So um, there's this triad called atopic triad, whereby a like three specific diseases tend to co-occur. So um, asthma, allergic rhinitis, and um, atopic dermatitis. So atopic dermatitis is eczema and allergic rhinitis is hay fever. So in patients with hay fever and with, um, with eczema, they're more likely to get asthma because these things tend to co-occur and in these patients with the samster well, sorry with this atopic triad um they have a very exaggerated very heightened response to allergens their immune system their immune cells tend to produce a lot of inflammatory cytokines and inflammatory mediators which you know makes the response to these allergens very much exaggerated another potential cause is um, like medications so there's another triad called samster's triad so in samster's triad we have patients with asthma nasal polyps and sensitivity to aspirin so in these patients when they receive aspirin they react to this again um, they are very sensitive to aspirin when they receive aspirin or other NSAIDs they get adverse reactions and the um, they get like upper and lower respiratory symptoms. Some of the other triggers or exacerbating factors can include dust, air pollutants, smoke, like tobacco smoke, secondhand smoke, um, pet hair, uh, bugs like cockroaches, um, even things like cold exercise. We have exercise induced asthma. Um, it can even be, it can even be exacerbated or triggered by emotional stress. Also for medication, I forgot to mention um, beta blockers as well because, you know, we have beta-2 receptors in, in our airways and epinephrine and norepinephrine bind to these beta-2 receptors to cause bronchodilation. So if we block them with beta blockers, what happens is that epinephrine and norepinephrine can't bind to this to dilate the, the bronchial. So what happens is we get bronchoconstriction instead. So beta blockers can also be a trigger or an exacerbating factor um, to asthma. Now let's briefly discuss the pathophysiology of asthma. So for instance, I have asthma and I breathe in some allergens. So I breathe in like pet hair, dust, smoke, air pollutants, whatever it may be. When this allergen um, gets into my airways, they, they come into contact with dendritic cells. And these dendritic cells, they engulf that um, allergen and undergo phagocytosis. And then after that, what they do is they kind of chop up the allergen <laughs> and present bits of that, which we now call antigen, on their cell membrane on a um, MHC2 complex. Okay, so once they've broken up that um, allergen to little bits we call antigen, they present that on their cell membrane on MHC2 complexes and show that to helper to, to, to um, helper cells we call T helper cells, specifically the T helper 2 cells. These T helper 2 cells, they produce interleukin-4 and interleukin-5. Interleukin-4, they go on and um, activate plasma cells. And these plasma cells produce antibodies. They produce um, IgE, and IgE goes to mast cells and trigger mast cell degranulation. So when this mast cell degranulates, it releases a lot of histamine and leukotrienes. Okay, so that's what happens with um, interleukin four. Interleukin four again. Let's just say that again. So interleukin four. They activate the um, plasma cells. Plasma cells release antibodies, including IgE. And this IgE causes mast cell degranulation. 
and then the mast cell releases leukotrienes and histamines. Interleukin-5 then. So interleukin-5 goes on and binds to eosinophils. And these eosinophils, when interleukin-5 um, binds to them, what they do is they release leukotrienes and proteases. And over time, if this condition is chronic, this eosinophil is releasing a lot of proteases, which can cause tissue damage. This is why um, for chronic asthma, we get some damage of the actual lung parenchyma. These histamines and leukotrienes released by the mast cells in the eosinophils, they do three specific things. So firstly, they induce um, bronchoconstriction of the airways, which makes their airways narrow. And the second one is they increase vascular permeability. So because of this increase in vascular permeability, some of those inflammatory mediators and those immune cells leak out to the mucosa, causing inflammation of the mucosa. The last thing is that they trigger a lot of mucus production. I want you guys to remember that asthma is reversible. So if we take away the trigger, whether that's dust, that smoke, or air pollutants, or pet hair, if we take away the trigger, usually the symptoms resolve, we go back to normal. But because of repeated exacerbations, we constantly get exposed to these triggers. What can happen is over time, this can lead to the permanent fibrosis, scarring, narrowing, and thickening of our airways. Let's now move on to the clinical features of asthma. So firstly, we can um, potentially hear a cough, so the person can have coughing. They can have shortness of breath or dyspnea. They can have chest tightness. They can have difficulty finishing their sentences because they're just having a hard time breathing. Um, because of this um, difficulty in breathing, we may see the use of accessory muscles like the scalenes or like the sternocleidomastoid. We can see retractions. We can see like supra um, sternal and supraclavicular retractions, even intercostal retractions. Um, when we uh, percuss, we when we percuss the chest, we may hear hyperresonance on percussion. This is because asthma is an obstructive lung disease, so there's a lot of air trapping, and therefore we're gonna um, hear hyperresonance on percussion. When we auscultate, or even just hearing the patient, even without their stethoscope, we may hear wheezing on expiration. Um, also, we can get a sputum sample, and when we look at that under a mi microscope, we're going to see specific things like the Kirschman spirals and charcoal-laden crystals. So charcoal-laden crystals are just broken down bits of eosinophil, basically. Moving on to diagnosis. So the gold standard for diagnosing asthma is uh, a pulmonary function test, or PFT. So in a pulmonary function test, what we ask the patient to do is to take in as like a maximal inspiration, take in as much air in possible. So inspire and as much as they can and try um, exhale as much as they can. So maximal inspiration and maximal expiration. So that's what we ask them to do. So for asthma patients, what we're going to see in their pulmonary function test is a, a decrease or a, a low um, FVC. So FVC is force vital capacity. So this is the amount of air that is exhaled after maximal inspiration. So this will be low because asthma is an obstructive disease. It's going to be difficult for them to blow all of those air, all of the air out and therefore the FVC is going to be low. On, uh, in addition to that, their FEV1 is also going to be markedly low, even lower. So FEV1 is force expiratory volume in one um, second. So this is how much um, air can be expired after maximal inspiration in one second. So this will be even lower for asthmatics. So when we take the ratio FEV1 to FVC ratio... If it's lower than 75%, then we can say we're dealing with an obstructive lung disease, okay? We wouldn't know at this point if it's COPD or asthma because both of those are obstructive lung diseases. But we know that if FEV1 over FVC, if the ratio is less than 75%, we have an obstructive lung disease. So how do we tell asthma from COPD? So... What we do is we give the patient a bronchodilator. So this is assuming that the patient is symptomatic, okay? So this we can do when the patient is symptomatic. So we give them a bronchodilator. 
So a bronchodilator is something like Saba, like albuterol. So if once we've given Saba, we do the, F, the PFT again, if their FEV1 improves greater than 12%, then we can say this is probably asthma because this demonstrates the reversibility of the condition. And like I said at the beginning, asthma is a reversible disease, you know. If FEV1 doesn't increase more than 12%, then this is more likely to be COPD because COPD is irreversible. Bronchodilators like asaba isn't going to do much for COPD. But for, for asthma, this is going to reverse the symptoms. And therefore, we will see an increase in FEV1. And again, the increase in FEV1 should be greater than 12%. If the patient is asymptomatic, what we can do is called a metacoline challenge. So again, we still have to perform the PFT. We still have to perform the pulmonary function test. We still need to measure their um, baseline um, FVC. FEV1 and calculate the ratio, so the FEV1 over FVC ratio, and all of these should be low. And then what we do is we give the metacholine, and metacholine um, basically bronchoconstricts the airways. It will induce bronchoconstriction in the airways. So we repeat our PFTs after we've given the metacholine. And what we're looking for is a drop in their FEV1 of 20% or more, okay? So again, we do PFTs to start with, get their initial readings. Their FVC, their FEV1, and FEV1 over FVC should be low anyway. Give them metacholine, repeat the test, and what we're looking for is a 20%, like at least 20% or more, decrease in their FEV1. Other non-specific tests we can do is we can order like a CBC, complete blood count. Um, obviously, we're gonna see elevated in white blood cells because there's an inflammation. But if we get if we can get those white cells differentiated, what we're gonna see is an increase in eosinophil specifically. Also, we may see um, when we get bloods an increase in Ig antibodies. Another thing we can do, which is again very non-specific, we can try get a chest X-ray, and all the chest X-ray will show us is the hyperinflation of the lung. So. Um, you know, a bigger volume of the lung and potentially even a flattened diaphragm, but not nothing much really. Now let's talk about the treatment. So we treat asthma based on the type of asthma, and the type of asthma depends on their depends on the frequency of daytime and nighttime symptoms, as well as their FEV one um, between the exacerbations. So the first one we have intermittent asthma. So with intermittent asthma. We have um, a patient with less than two um, like daytime symptoms per week, and they have less than three nighttime symptoms per month. And between exacerbation, exacerbations, their FEV, FEV1 is greater than 80%, okay? And for these patients with intermittent asthma, what we give them is a SABA a short-acting beta-2 agonist, for instance, albuterol. So we can give this to them via a meter dose inhaler or a dry powder inhaler. And the way that this works is they bind to beta-2 adrenergic receptors in their airways and they induce bronchodilation. We need to be careful though because we have beta, res beta 2 receptors elsewhere, we have beta receptors elsewhere in the body, like in the heart for instance. So we need to be cautious because this may affect the heart and cause tachyarrhythmias. This may affect the skeletal muscles and cause tremors. Um, sometimes patients may even complain of dizziness. Sabas are absolutely contraindicated in patients with narrow angle glaucoma because these medications will increase their intraocular pressure even more, which will make their glaucoma worse. The next type is mild asthma. So in mild asthma, we still get fewer than two um, per week of daytime symptoms, but nighttime symptoms, we get between three and four nighttime symptoms. And between their exacerbations, their FEV1 is still over 80%. So in these patients with mild asthma, we still give them SABA, PRN, as needed, but we add a low-dose inhaled corticosteroid. So an example of um, inhaled corticosteroid include feticazone, 
um, butanicide and mom mometasone, I think, is one as well. Um, the way that inhaled corticosteroids or, cor or corticosteroids in general, the way that they work is they like inhibit the release of cytokines and they inhibit the activation of white blood cells and the migration and chemotaxis of these white blood cells to the site of inflammation. Therefore, basically what they do is they dampen the immune response. So an adverse drug reaction from um, a, a inhaled corticosteroid can be like candidiasis or oral thrush. So we advise the patients who take inhaled corticosteroids that every time they take inhaled corticosteroids, they need to wash their mouth and, with water and spit it out so that, you know, just to decrease the risk of getting candidiasis. The next type is moderate asthma. So in moderate asthma, we get seven times per week daytime symptoms and we get at least once per week of nighttime symptoms. And their FEV1 between the exacerbations would be between 60 to 8%. So in this patient, we have two options. So option one, we give them option one, we give them a SABA, plus we up their dose of inhaled corticosteroids. So we give them medium dose um, inhaled corticosteroids. That's option one. SABA plus medium dose inhaled corticosteroids. Option two is a SABA, a low dose inhaled corticosteroids plus a LABA. So from the patient's point of view, it's probably better to give them option one because it's much easier to be compliant with two medications rather than three. So I think the preferred option would be option one, which is just upping the dose of inhaled corticosteroids plus giving SABA as PRN when as needed. So a LABA or a long-acting beta-2 adrenergic agonist Basically, they have kind of the same mechanism of action as SABA. They bind to beta-2 adrenergic receptors in the airways, inducing bronchodilation. Um, an example can be salmeterol. And they have exactly the same adverse drug reactions as SABA. So again, um, they can cause tachycardia or any tachyarrhythmias in the heart. They can cause um, muscle tremors and even dizziness. On top of that, there are some black box warnings for um, a LABA. So we must never give LABA on its own without an inhaled corticosteroid. And LABA can, must never be used in acute exacerbations, okay? So we can't give LABA without an inhaled corticosteroid, and we can't give LABA for acute exacerbations of asthma. The last type, which is the worst type, is severe asthma. So in severe asthma, we have um, daytime symptoms every day, usually throughout the day, and nighttime symptoms every night throughout the night. And their FEV1 is less than 60%. So in this case, we have three options, Option, depending on the severity of the severe asthma. So we start with a SABA PRN plus a medium dose corticosteroid plus a LABA. So that's option one. Option two, if option one doesn't work, we up the dose of inhaled corticosteroids. So we give SABA, PRN, high dose corticosteroids, and a LABA. If this still doesn't work, what we do is we give the patient SABA as PRN, we give them high dose inhaled corticosteroids, we give them a LABA, and on top of that, we give them PO corticosteroids or oral um, corticosteroids. So PO corticosteroids or corticosteroids that we give um, orally, not the inhaled form. Examples include methylprednisolone, prednisone, and prednisolone. So these um, are only for short term. We would never give this long term. This is only reserved for acute exacerbations or if the, if it gets really, really, really bad. Um, and like there are multiple adverse drug reactions, I mean, yeah, adverse drug reactions from in, from um, PO corticosteroids. So the patient may develop hypertension, hyperglycemia, and depression of the immune system, which is kind of how it works. But again, this makes them more susceptible of getting infection. I think it's also worth mentioning other drugs that we can use um, that's not in this like general protocol. So we can use um, like leukotriene, 
receptor antagonist, so like Montelukast. So um, what this does, <laughs> well, it says it on the name. So they bind to leukotriene receptors and therefore prevent the binding of leukotriene. So these receptors preventing the action of leukotriene. So which are the three main ones I said at the beginning for pathophysiology. Leukotrienes, they cause bronchoconstriction of the airway, mucus buildup, and increased vascular permeability, meaning that the immune cells and the inflammatory mediators can leak out to the mucosa, causing mucosal inflammation. So it stops all of this from happening. Um, an adverse drug reaction can be like suicide attempts. Um, this is an ongoing research, by the way. It has been linked to suicide attempts. And this is particularly good for atopic asthma, so like allergic asthma. Um, the other one is called mast cell stabilizer. So an example would be like chromalin sodium. So again, it does what it says. <laughs> it stabilizes mast cells. It prevents the mast cells from degranulating, from, from mast cell degranulation, preventing it from releasing a lot of histamines and leukotrienes, which lead to mucus buildup, bronchoconstriction, and increased um, vascular permeability in the airway, leading to um, inflammation of the mucosa. So it prevents all of that. Um, from happening um, by preventing the degranulation of those mast cells. This can be good for exercise or cold-induced asthma. The last one is omalizumab. So omalizumab is like an anti-IgE drug. <laughs> so IgE, recall that it binds to mast cells and it triggers mast cell degranulation. So when mast cell degranulates, we get histamine and leukotrienes. Um, so it works by, you know, um, and by preventing IgE from um, catalyzing or from making the mast cell degranulate. So this is very good for severe allergic asthma. The only problem is it's really, really expensive. Now for the last part, let's talk about what we do and how we treat patients who present with us with really bad like really severe, fatal, life-threatening, acute exacerbation of their asthma. So we can tell that it's really bad or fatal. For, for instance, when we take their O2 sats and it's less than 92%, we, th we take their peak expiratory flow rate and it's less than 25%. Um, we can't hear any more wheezing. The patient probably can't talk anymore. Um, when we do their ABG, uh, we will see a high partial pressure of CO2, which means that they are not hyperventilating anymore. They're not getting rid of that CO2 anymore. So it's just building up. In this scenario, this is very bad because now we're at the stage of respiratory acidosis. And this means that we have complete obstruction of the airways because CO2 is just building up. We're not getting rid of it anymore. So in this situation, we start um, by giving the patient really, really high um, oxygen. So we put them on a non-rebreather mask. We give them a lot of supplemental oxygen to keep their saturations, um, O2 sats, to something greater than 92%. Okay, that's the first thing we do. The second thing that we do is we can give them a Saba plus a Sama. Saba, like I said, it's a short-acting beta-2 adrenergic agonist, and a Sama is a short-acting muscarinic antagonist. So a Sama, for example, um, ipatropium, so it's an anticholinergic. So it binds to muscarinic receptors in the airways, preventing acetylcholine from binding to it. And um, what acetylcholine does is it promotes bronchoconstriction. So if we block this, we promote bronchodilation. The third thing we can give this patient is um, IV or, P or PO um, corticosteroids. And the fourth thing can be IV magnesium sulfate. So what magnesium sulfate does is it blocks calcium channels, like promoting very intense dilation of the smooth muscles in the airway. So it would cause intense bronchodilation. If that's still not effective, we can put them on CPAP, so positive airway ventilation. And if, again, all of this doesn't work, we may have to intubate the patient. So we need to intubate the patient. We do this via um, an endotracheal um, intubation.